Welcome to Harvard Business Review Facebook Live. Today, we are going to be talking about presenting in English if you are a non-native speaker. My name is Deborah Grayson Regal, and I'm the Director of Learning for the Boda Group, a leadership and team development firm. I'm also the author of Tips of the Tongue, the Non-Native English Speaker's Guide to Mastering Public Speaking. I have been working with clients all over the world for about 25 years, both in my role as a speaker and as an executive coach and a workshop facilitator. I also instruct management communications at Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania, and I have served as a, a professor of executive communications at the Beijing International MBA program at Peking University. So I have traveled the world doing this work, and I'm glad that you are joining us today from wherever in the world you are. And we'd like to give you an opportunity to share on Facebook where you are chatting in from today. So please take a moment and tell us what country or city you are coming in from, and we'll hear from some of you. Where are our viewers and listeners from today? Let's see. So we have Malaysia, Vietnam so far. Where else is everybody from? They're commenting right now, so we'll see some more as we go. Excellent. Look, terrific. So we've got folks joining us today from all over the world. And I want to share with you who should be here, who should be participating in today's discussion about presentation skills for non-native English speakers. First of all, you'll want to be a part of this conversation today if you are a non-native English speaker and many of your business presentations are ones that you make in English and in particular to American audiences. Number two, you want to be a part of today's conversation if you support the professional development or inclusion needs of non-native English speakers in your organization. And number three, whether you speak English as your native language or speak some other language and you know that you want to become a better and more skillful presenter, join us. You're going to get some tips that will work for you today. And again, we are going to have the opportunity to take your comments and questions during the program and at the end, so please keep the chat alive. Here's what we're going to be covering today, and this is based on the work that we do with our clients and also based on what we cover in the book, Tips of the Tongue. We're going to be talking about confidence, how to manage the anxiety of presentations in general, and some of the specific needs that non-native English speakers have when presenting in a language that isn't natural or known to them. We're going to be talking about cultural comfort. What are some of the nuances, clues, and cues that you need to keep in mind, in particular for presenting to an American business audience? And number three, we're going to talk about competence. What are some of the technical skills that all presenters need to have to be passionate and persuasive and powerful, and might have some differences between some of the technical skills that you've learned in your country or culture of origin? And before we cover these three C's, I want to add a fourth C, which is context. Why does this matter? Why is this important? As Harvard Business School Associate Professor Tzadal Neely writes in her Harvard Business Review article, the global language of business is English. But it's not just enough to be able to speak English. If you are a leader or plan on becoming one, you need to know how to influence customers, sell products, services, and ideas, engage your employees, build teams, rally the troops, develop a presence, and every single one of those things requires not just that you speak a language, but that you actually know how to present in that language. And so that's part of the reason that presentation skills, especially in English, is so important, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So. Let's move to our first C, confidence. And confidence is about managing the anxiety associated with public speaking in general. American author Mark Twain once commented, there are two types of speakers, those who are nervous and those who are liars. What was he telling us? He was telling us that everybody gets nervous when they present. It might be different situations, different audiences, different contexts, but every single person has something that causes them anxiety, especially if they care about the impact they're having and the outcomes they're looking to achieve. 
I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I'm making a presentation right now. And how many people do I have in my audience? No, Alex, don't tell me. I don't want to know. I'm better off not knowing how many people are watching right <laughs> now, live, or watching this recorded. And I am doing all of this as a native English speaker. So while I'm really committed and excited to having a positive impact and sharing important information with you, because I care, there's a little bit of anxiety associated with this. And I recognize that I'm doing it in my native language. So I want to take a moment to share with you what some of our clients have explained to us about what makes presenting in English when English isn't their native language so challenging. So first, we'll look to a client from China who shared with us, it is a very difficult task if you're not familiar with the content and you have to constantly recall what you're going to say in another language and at the same time come up with adequate grammar and wording. Does that sound familiar to anybody who's joining us today? Let us know. Here's a comment that we got from one of our clients who's a native Korean speaker. This speaker was even more pessimistic. I think one will be good at delivering what one prepared, but if the presentation goes beyond this scope, the situation will turn one's brain to mush and the disaster will begin. And finally, I'll share with you the perspective of one of our French-speaking clients. Speaking in public has always been a struggle. This may come from the school system because if you hadn't done your homework, your punishment was to present something to the class and you were put in the spotlight. French people, she says, are amazed and impressed at how at ease Americans are in presenting. Let me let you in on a little secret. Americans in general are not at ease with presenting. If they were, I would have to find another job. But one of the things we want to keep in mind is that all speakers get nervous and non-native English speakers have additional challenges. So let's turn it over to you for a moment. Take a moment in your Facebook chat to share with us what are some of the sources of anxiety for you as a speaker. All right, so let's see. We're wondering the impact of social media on the English language. Um, let's see what else. We're getting a few comments in here, but let us know, comment, and we will be sure to get to those. So it sounds like folks are thinking about social media as one part of presentations, and, and the reason that social media has an impact on people's anxiety of presentation is that anything you say in public is often recorded and becomes permanent so that you know that when you talk in public it could potentially have a life well beyond the presentation that you're making. I see we have another comment. Yes, yes we do. So um, they're all coming in now. Thank you for sending them. So how to engage with the audience, structure of presentation, crowds, interruptions, um, even prejudice. Yes, so many of those are challenges that any presenter experiences, regardless of what their native language is. And in our work and in our research, we found that non-native English speakers have additional challenges beyond that. So for example, speaking with an accent and wondering whether they'll be understood. Word retrieval, am I going to be able to access the word that I need at the moment that I need it? wondering about cultural norms and nuances. Am I going to say the right thing or the wrong thing? Am I doing the right hand gestures or am I going to offend somebody? Wondering if you are using or misusing idiomatic phrases. So the list of what non-native English speakers have to deal with is long and it makes a lot of sense. And I want to share with you three specific strategies that we recommend non-native English speakers use when trying to manage the confidence associated with speaking in public. So, the first strategy that we recommend is to separate out the facts from the story you make up about the facts. So let's talk about what some facts are for non-native English speakers. English isn't my native language. I speak with an accent. I can't always choose the exact word I want when I want it. Those are facts. They're pretty neutral sounding if you ask me. But we don't think in facts. We tend to quickly move from the facts 
to the story we make up about what the facts are. So let's try on the kind of story that I often hear from my clients. English isn't my native language, and so I speak with an accent, and I can't always retrieve the word that I want when I want it. And because of that, I'm not the kind of presenter that anybody's going to want to listen to. And if nobody wants to listen to me, I'm not going to be able to impact people. And if I can't have an impact on people, I'm not going to become a leader in this role. And if I can't become a leader here, I'm going to need to find another job. And from what I know, jobs in my industry are really pretty limited. So if I don't figure out how to present better, I'm not going to be employed. That is a pretty far leap, if you ask me, from English isn't my primary language, and I speak with an accent to I'm going to be jobless. And I want you to understand that the stories that non-native English speakers tell themselves are quite overwhelming and quite scary, and you get to write a new story. So let me give you an example of the kind of story that I suggest you consider with the same facts. English isn't my native language. I speak with an accent. I can't always retrieve the exact word I want when I want it. Here's a different story. People are impressed that I speak multiple languages. People are going to give me the benefit of the doubt. If I ask for help, people are going to be happy to give it to me. And my professional competence and leadership is not solely judged on my command of the language. How does that story feel instead? Hopefully, it feels a little bit more empowering. So the first strategy to manage your confidence is to separate out the facts from the story that you are making up about the facts. Let me give you a second strategy, which is the power of the pause. And a pause is a gift to you as, your, as a speaker. It's also a gift to the audience. So let's talk a little bit about accented speech. So accented speech causes a hearing disturbance in the ears of the audience. The research shows that when people listen to a speaker who has an accent, it causes the same sort of disturbance as slight hearing loss or a lot of ambient background noise. So what do you need to do to minimize that disturbance? You need to pause more. When you pause more, you will slow down your rate of speaking. And when you slow down your rate of speaking, you give your listeners the time to acclimate their listening to your speaking until the point that your accent becomes barely noticeable. So recognizing that about a minute into your presentation, if you have taken your time, your accent will become unnoticeable or barely noticeable should increase your confidence and lower your anxiety. In addition, what can you do with some of those pauses? You can breathe. And when you breathe, you are sending oxygen to your body, and it reduces all of the visible symptoms that you might experience when you're feeling anxious as well. When you breathe during the pauses, you slow your heart rate down, the sweating reduces, the color in your face or the loss of color in your face reduces, those shaky hands will get a little steadier. So a pause is a gift to your audience as well as to you. And let's talk about one more strategy. Perfection. And here's what I think about perfection. Do not aim for perfection. That is not the goal. The goal is to be polished and practiced. But if your goal is to become a perfect presenter, number one, you probably won't achieve it considering how subjective presentations are. And it's going to really ratchet up the level of anxiety for you. So I want to share with you a strategy that I share with all of my clients who are looking to become better presenters regardless of what their native language is. The goal is to present in a way that sounds conversational rather than perfect. And here's what I know. I know that when I'm having a regular conversation, let's say you and I are talking about something, and if I mispronounce a word, if I forget what I'm going to say, if I stumble, stutter, or stammer, you're going to forgive that. You probably won't even notice that I've done that because I'm speaking in a regular conversation. If you present in a conversational tone, 
Nobody is asking for you to be perfect. They're wanting you to be engaging and relatable. And so don't aim for perfection. You want to have a little bit more perspective than that and aim to be conversational so that people can build warmth and rapport with you. So that's our first C, confidence. Let's move to our second C, cultural comfort. And cultural comfort is about understanding and adapting to some of the nuances and norms, in particular around American style business presentations. And yes, there is such a thing. Now, one of the comments that we often hear from our clients is, if I adapt to a different culture, am I going to be giving up my authentic self? I still want to feel like me. And I really do understand that. I often feel like that as a native New Yorker, right? So as a native New Yorker, I tend to speak really quickly. I also tend to be very direct in my communication style. And when I speak in other parts of my own country, when I travel to the South, when I travel to the Midwest, I need to adapt my style. And when I travel overseas, I need to adapt my style as well. It doesn't make me feel inauthentic if I keep in mind that the goal is to be respectful of the audience and to be mindful of their needs. And that is true of any presenter and any presentation to be respectful of the audience and mindful of their needs. Now, one of the things that I don't have, I've got a whiteboard, I've got books, I've got all kinds of things here. One of the things that I don't have is a giant neon sign. But if I had a giant neon sign that was blinking right now, it would say, Sweeping generalizations ahead. Why? Because we're talking about culture. And culture is highly nuanced. It is highly specific. It is variable. And there is no way that we will be able to capture everything about a culture. It's just not true. So what we're going to talk about are some trends that can be helpful for you in thinking about American-style business presentations. But with any presentation, talking about culture and understanding culture is not a substitute for you doing your homework and finding out about this particular audience and this particular audience's needs. And I also want to share with you some resources that have been particularly helpful to me and particularly helpful to my clients on the topic. So one resource is The Culture Map by Aaron Meyer. Another resource is Pitch Tweet and Engage on the Street by Kara Alemo. And a third is Global Dexterity by Andy Malinsky. Those three resources will give you a tremendous amount of insight around cross-cultural communication. Right now, we're going to look at it through the context of what it means in an American-style business presentation. So back to the drawing board, cultural comfort. One thing to keep in mind is that Americans tend to be explicit. And here's what I mean by explicit in a presentation. The expectation is that you are going to say what you need to say directly, that you are not going to make people do the work of inferring from other contexts what it is that you mean, and you have something important to say, and when you have something important to say, repeat it. That feels important. I think I'm going to repeat it. When you have something important to say, you want to repeat it to make sure that it really lands with a distracted audience. So those are three ways in which you can present in an explicit American style. So that's one factor to keep in mind. A second factor to keep in mind is that American business audiences, in general, process deductively. And here's what that means for you as a presenter to an American business audience. As an American business audience, you want to be mindful that you want to start with your headline or your key message up top. And then you will support it with a story, statistics, or facts. It is not our style to wonder what your point is going to be. We are too impatient for that. And again, that might be a cultural norm that relates to me. But in general, you want to start with your big idea and then support it. That's one way that deductive thinking comes in. Some other factors to keep in mind for deductive thinkers is that you want to be practical and tactical in your presentation, not just theoretical or philosophical. 
And a third way that deductive thinking comes into play in a business presentation is deduction around time. And here's what I mean. If you have an hour during which you are supposed to speak and your audience takes a look at their watch and they notice that 45 minutes have passed, they are going to deduce that you will be finished in 15 minutes from now and you will be deducted points from your presentation if you think of time as fluid. And I know from my work that that is culturally nuanced, but American business presentations should end on time. So that's another piece of cultural comfort. Uh, uh, cu cultural comfort. And the third one that I want to share today, among all of the things we could talk about today, is that you are expected to promote your own ideas. And I know from the clients that I've worked with around the world that this of everything can feel the most challenging. But if you have an idea, service, or product that you are selling, you are expected to convey your confidence in it. You are expected to share your credibility and credentials around it. And you are supposed to be visibly enthusiastic around your own ideas. If I were going to say anything about this, I would say that in American business presentations, there is very rarely room for false modesty, and sometimes there is no room for genuine modesty either. So if you've got an idea you want to sell, you want to get fully behind that idea. I think US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt summed up the American business style best when he said, be sincere, be brief, be seated. So let's transition from cultural comfort to our last area, which is competence. And competence is about the technical skills necessary to become a powerful, persuasive presenter. And we need technical skills in any language that we present in. And the reason that we talk about these technical skills is that some of the technical skills that you may have learned in your native culture and native language can feel very different from the kind of technical skills that are expected when you are making a business presentation in English, especially to an American audience. So let's talk about when it comes to competence, there are three V's that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about verbal, the way that we use our words. We're going to talk about vocal, the way that we use our voice. And we're going to talk about visual. Okay. So verbal, the way that we use our words. Let's assume that you have a healthy command of the language, use simple words. Use short sentences. This is not the opportunity you want to take advantage of to demonstrate how fluent you are. You want to demonstrate that you understand your ideas well enough to convey them simply. Don't make it hard for your listeners to follow along. Be short and simple. Use colorful language wherever possible to create an emotional, evocative presentation, but don't complicate things. Another part of verbal to keep in mind is that in English, we have punctuation marks. Not all languages have punctuation marks, which means that we have periods, we have commas, we have question marks, we have exclamation points. To become an engaging presenter, you actually want your punctuation marks to be audible. And so you want to bring those to life as part of your presentation. If it's a question, it should sound like a question. If it's a statement, it should sound like a statement. And one other comment that I want to make about verbal is that I want to invite you to bring words, phrases, and sayings from your language, country, or culture into the presentation. You've got beautiful language that can add color and intrigue and allow you to feel proud of where you have originally come from, I invite you to bring it in. And I want to share with you that several years ago, I was presenting in Israel to a group of Hebrew speakers. And they shared with me a word that was a new word for me in Hebrew, for which there was no real English equivalent. And if there is, I am quite sure that somebody will post it on Facebook. The Hebrew word is firgun. And forgive my accent if I didn't pronounce that correctly, firgun. And the rough translation of it is delight in somebody else's accomplishment. What a beautiful word that is. And so now, 
when I am asking managers and leaders to have delight in somebody else's accomplishment, I'll bring this Hebrew word that I learned in Israel in to explain a concept that I think should be shared around the world. Wouldn't the world be a whole lot nicer with a little more fear gun in it? So bring some of your words into the presentation as well. Let's move to our second V, vocal. And this is the way in which you use your voice. We talked about the pause. The pause is a great way to build intrigue. You also want to manage your speed as part of your voice as well. If you want to build excitement, you're going to speak a little bit more quickly. If you want to make sure that people are drawn in, take your time. One of the things that we know from the research is that people bring the vocal tone of their native language into new languages. And so this may require a little bit of adapting on your part to shift up the tone of the way that you naturally speak into uh, something in English that feels engaging and compelling. So think about the tone, your pitch, and the pace of your voice. And then finally, let's move to visual. And by way of moving into visual, I have a visual. So I'm going to put a little map up, and then I'm going to tell you what this map is about. So this map over here demonstrates research that was presented by Adrian Wood that shows different countries' migration patterns. And here's what this has to do with visual. In countries where ha there has been a tremendous amount of migration, meaning people have come from other countries into this country, people tend to be more visibly emotionally expressive in their speaking compared to countries where there is not a lot of migration. Why is that? Well, if there's not a lot of migration in your country, everybody speaks the same language. And so you can rely solely on the verbal language to get your point across. But if you're living in a country where multiple languages are being spoken, you need to use your face, your hands, your eyes, your bodies to communicate ideas when language alone won't, language alone won't work. And so you'll notice here that countries that have high rates of migration include the United States, include Canada, include Australia, and you will notice that Canadians, Americans, and Australians tend to be more emotionally expressive in their presentations, and so there is an expectation that you will do so as well. In countries like China, Japan, areas like North Africa and Scandinavia, people are less visibly emotionally expressive, and so you may need to adapt to an American business audience and be a little bit more emotionally expressive. What else can I tell you about visual? I want to share two other parts of visual that have strong cultural influences that I'm going to invite you to keep in mind when presenting to a business audience in America in particular. Smiling and eye contact. Smiling is highly cultural. We know that in America, we tend to smile a little bit more. In other countries in the world, smiling, dare I say, is frowned upon. <laughs> but smiling from a stranger in particular is often met with suspicion. And I recognize that you may be bringing some of the norms from your original culture into America if you are presenting here. But it is generally accepted that unless you are delivering a presentation of devastating news, you will give a little smile to build warmth and rapport, to build connection, to demonstrate your openness, and also to show that you are honored and happy to be here. In addition to smiling, eye contact is something that has strong cultural nuances and may take some work to practice. We know that in many other cultures, eye contact should feel short and often has to do with hierarchy as well. In American business culture, Making eye contact feels important to build a connection and build trust. People who do not make eye contact, people who look at the floor, look at the ceiling, look at any place other than their audience are seen as not trustworthy. And you do not want to be considered a non-trustworthy presenter or leader. And so this may be challenging. That being said, deep, intense, extended eye contact in any culture is a problem. And so you want to keep a guideline of about three to five seconds per person and then move on to the next one. So when it comes to competence, you're going to need to work on your language, short and sweet, 
vocal, tone of voice, visual, making sure that you are emotionally expressive and that you smile and make eye contact. And that is the full package. Before we move on to take some questions from you on the topic of presenting in English if you're a non-native speaker, I want to share with you a quote from Carol Dweck, author of Mindset. And she wrote, becoming is better than being. So if you already are a polished, powerful, persuasive presenter, I commend you. What an incredible skill to have developed. But if you are in the process of becoming one, especially if English is not your native language, I want you to pat yourself on the back and give yourself the credit for trying to master a skill that even native English speakers wrestle with. So now we are going to turn it over to our Facebook audience and take a couple of questions. Yes, excellent. So first of all, all of our readers from around the world are very thankful to you. They're thanking you. They're very gracious for everything you're sharing today. So our first question comes from Sajwan, and they're asking, is vocabulary important? Simple but multiple sentences, so what kind of structure there? Yeah, so vocabulary falls under verbal, and I'll repeat the idea of using simple words and short sentences. The goal is not to impress, the goal is to inform and to aim to build a connection. And one of the things that I want to say is that if you are speaking in a particular industry where there are words, concepts, and acronyms that you should know, regardless of what language you speak, you need to get yourself educated on the language of the culture or the industry. But other than that, you want to keep your sentences short and sweet. Great, thank you. So our next question comes from, from Zenkana. How will the audience decode the message I want them to decode? So this goes back to being explicit, right? One of the hallmarks of an American presentation style is that we tell people right away the message that we want them to decode so that they don't have to decode it. So you will lead your presentation after you have made an introduction with an objective. Here's what we're going to talk about today, or here's the purpose of today. We, you lead with the headline, and then you follow it with a preview. Here are the three things that we're going to talk about today. So today I modeled that by saying confidence, cultural comfort, and competence. There was no decoding necessary. You want to actually lay out the path for your audience quite clearly and explicitly. Excellent. All right, so our next question comes from Hugo. How to jump from formal English to colloquial one in the middle of the presentation? So I think what they're saying is, how do you jump from you know, that colloquial English to more formal English? Yeah, so a big part of knowing what kind of English to use, whether it's more formal business language or something that feels uh, warmer, more informal, is knowing the audience and knowing the culture. So in some of the presentations that I make, my language needs to be a little bit more formal because that is reflective of the culture and that is what will earn me the respect and the credibility of my audience. And it, with other presentations that I make, I know that I can be very informal and in fact even use industry in speak with them because that demonstrates my credibility that I know it. So that is very much about knowing your audience and their preferences and then making a decision if you're lucky, you'll be with the kind of audience where you get to use both and you can weave in and out. And I also know for non-native English speakers, weaving in and out is a particular challenge. Okay, thank you. So we can take about one or two more. Let's see, Ben Koba asks, should there be a variation in one style of presentation? So while presenting content to a small or a large group? So you always want your style to feel like a natural extension of your conversation style. Right? We talked about that when we talked about getting rid of perfection. You don't want to sound overly scripted. And you may need to adapt your style if you have three people in a room and you are sitting around a conference table. That may feel really different than standing up in front of a hundred or a thousand people as well. Part of what will feel different is the level of formality and the level of connection that you have. And again, you also need to understand the culture of the particular industry, company, and audience to know what presentation style will resonate for them. That being said, 
all of these still hold true regardless of whether it is an informal client meeting or something that is a formal board meeting. Every single thing here, managing your confidence, these elements of cultural comfort and how you present using verbal, vocal, or visual will be the same regardless. Okay, excellent. So we have time for one more question. This one comes from Mike. And Mike's asking, how should I deal with or adjust to an impatient or disconnected American audience? So disconnected often looks a lot like this, right? We often notice that people in the room are on their phones or focused on other things. One of the topics that we talk about in the book is how to create audience engagement. So how do you throw a question to the audience that requires them to respond to you? How do you stop speaking, take a break, and ask people to talk to each other in pairs or groups of three, which means that they don't have to pay attention to you, but they do have to pay attention to the content that you're doing? How do you give your audience members a job or a responsibility? How do you give them the opportunity to showcase what they know so that you're not the only speaker in the room, which gives you the opportunity to pause and take a breath as well? So you will want to partner with your audience and engage them in the conversation in order to keep them from checking out like this. So I want to thank you so much for tuning in today. If you were joining us live and if you are watching this recorded, I hope that this felt like a valuable use of your time. Please let me know how I can be helpful to your work with leaders and teams. And regardless of what language you speak, Everybody needs to become a more powerful, polished, and persuasive presenter.